our National Trustees. First, Charlie Hees, Trustee and President of Branch 36, New York. Sandy Lamell, President, I'm oh, sorry, Trustee and President of Branch 1, Detroit, Michigan.
It's great to be here with all of you. I want to start this morning by offering a special thanks to Grace 34. We heard from President Tom Rooney this morning, and uh, he gave us a very concise education on the city of Boston. But it takes a lot of people from the local branch to make one of these conventions move, and Branch 34 has been excellent. Thank you all. And thank you most of all to all of you, the delegates. We would not be here without you. So thank you all for taking the time to travel here and carry out the important business of our great union, the National Association of Letter Carriers. Whether it's your first convention or your 20th, welcome. I'm glad you're here. We are glad you're here. And I hope you look forward to a productive and exciting week. We're fortunate to be gathering for our 73rd convention in Boston, one of America's greatest labor cities. Boston, of course, was the birthplace of the American Revolution heard about that this morning. We all know the story of the Boston Tea Party, the legend of Paul Revere's famous midnight ride, and the battles of Lexington and Concord. But what you may not know is that more than a hundred years before those historical events, the first post office of the British colonies was established right here. Colonies was established, the office of the British colonies was established right here in the city of Boston. In 1639, the Massachusetts General Court created a post office for letters coming in and out of the colonies to overseas posts. While our post office, that particular post office, is no longer here, our postal system is still essential now, nearly 400 years later. Boston also holds some important NALC history. It is the birthplace of our national publication, Postal Record. Boston is also the location that our members chose to hold their very first national convention. They convened here in 1890, just one year after our union was founded in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. While this convention looks a little bit different. I think there's probably a few more people and I don't think they had nearly this many screens. What I do know is that our mission is the same as it was in 1890. To come together to fight for the rights and working lives of city letter carriers. And that is exactly what we are going to do here this week. Much work has been done a lot has been accomplished since we convened in Chicago just two years ago. We are and have been deep in negotiations with the Postal Service for a new collective bargaining agreement, an agreement that would fairly reward letter carriers for our contributions to the Postal Service. We're now more than three years in to the Postal Service's 10-year strategic plan, the Delivery for America plan. While this plan isn't perfect, the larger goal of modernization of the Postal Service is essential for our future. We've been heavily involved in all aspects of the plan that both directly and indirectly affect city letter carriers. We've had an impact on its major components, such as the design of the next generation delivery vehicles and the opening of the new sorting and delivery centers. And we've successfully advocated for changes in the plan related to the overall transformation of postal operations. We've also dealt with staffing shortages. So dealt with staffing, so dealt with staffing shortages by negotiating numerous MOUs with the Postal Service to implement an all-career model in hundreds of installations around the country, resulting in improved staffing in many locations. We've helped uphold democracy in the 2020 midterm elections by delivering tens of billions of ballots. Our work ensured, once again, a safe and accessible election, and we will do that again this November. We 
state engaged on Capitol Hill fighting for our interests, all while working to continue to grow participation in our Letter Care Political Fund. Once again, we host the Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive, the largest one-day food drive in the country, and in 2024, we collected nearly 50% more food than we did in 2023. And we have even bigger plans in 2025. across the country, once again, as we've done for many years, got creative holding fundraising events for our official charity, the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Last year, we surpassed our fundraising goal of $1 million, and we are on track to do that again.
on a day-to-day -day basis, we work to ensure that we continue to serve the American people. Letter carriers have long known the power of our network, our workforce, and our craft. And the pandemic reminded the rest of the country. We are the heartbeat of the Postal Service. We keep it running, and we always will. Aside from pandemic-related challenges, crime against letter carriers has been on the rise. Yet another factor making our jobs more difficult, and in some cases, undermining the Postal Service's ability to attract new letter carriers to the job. When we opened bargaining, Unemployment rates are at a 50 year low, giving job seekers plenty of options. Organized labor in the private sector has celebrated some massive victories in the time since we last met in Chicago, and private sector wages have soared. Last year alone resulted in historic agreements for auto workers, UPS employees, screenwriters, actors, pilots, teachers, and more. We stood in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and celebrated every single one of those victories. However, despite these labor wins and a booming economy, it is a reality that the Postal Service was and is in a much different position than most private sector employers. Than most private sector position than most private sector employers. Even though the Postal Service had record-breaking increases in parcel revenue during the pandemic and the crushing pre-funding mandate was revealed through the Postal Service Reform Act, higher than expected costs due to surging inflation, inflation significant investment in new infrastructure, and the high employee turnover costs all contributed to the Postal Service reporting a loss of $6.5 billion in fiscal year 2020. While it's certainly challenging to negotiate with an employer that's losing money, we've been doing that for 15 years, we saw this as an opportunity. Through a fair contract, the Postal Service could strengthen the letter care workforce and in turn bolster the Postal Service's ability to achieve the goals in its plan. Our primary goals were simple from the start. Obtain wage increases and maintain Place it with a single pay table that not only increases starting pay, but also raises top pay while reducing the time it takes to get there. Yep. So did we get it? Maintaining our protections against job threats like subcontracting, negotiate changes to work rules that benefit our members. All these proposals that we submit in collective bargaining are derived from resolutions submitted by branches and state associations that are then debated at the national convention and adopted by delegates to those conventions to become official bargaining positions of the NALC. Every one of us in this room should be energized by the opportunity we have to do that again this week. We have been in continuing good faith negotiations with the Postal Service from the start. This year, we have been operating on dual tracks, finalizing preparations for interest arbitration while continuing to meet and discuss issues with the Postal Service, issue, issues with the Postal Service to work towards a negotiated agreement. In March, NALC and the Postal Service selected arbitrator Dennis Nolan to serve as a neutral chair of a three-person interest arbitration panel. You may remember arbitrator Nolan previously served as our neutral arbitrator in our interest arbitration proceedings for the 2019 agreement, which were nearly completed when we reached a negotiated settlement in late 2020. We were in the process of scheduling interest arbitration hearing dates when progress in our talks with the Postal Service 
began to move more quickly a few weeks ago. Since then, we have spent a week in a hotel lockdown with our counterparts in the postal service where we made even more progress. Today, we are near agreement on the major economic pieces of a tentative agreement. It is very possible, even likely, that a tentative agreement to send out NALC members to consider a ratification will be reached. And such an agreement will address the goals that I've outlined from the start of this process last year. <laughs> cannot be said enough. If our goal was to reach an agreement as fast as possible, we could have done that long ago. But that isn't and never will be our goal. We are focused on getting the best agreement we can from our parents. We will not accept anything less. This is what we have always done. Our history tells us that this process tells us that this process takes time. It takes longer than I like. Yeah. Trust me, I've been in the LC headquarters for 13 years trying to make a lot of negotiations with the Postal Service happen faster. But I am committed to staying in this fight to get what our members have earned and deserve. We are almost there, and we are going to finish that job. <laughs> but to be clear, even though I don't expect it, we are ready to go to interest arbitration if things fall apart in negotiations. I'm confident in the case we built, and I believe, if necessary, it will result in a favorable outcome for us. But I can assure you of this. Any negotiated agreement that is sent to our members for ratification will be one that fairly rewards and compensates letter carriers for our vital contribution to the Postal Service, and one that will uphold our union's 50-plus year tradition of achieving the best results we can in collective bargaining. Mm. While collective bargaining is rightfully so dominated, much of our union's work since we last met in Chicago, mm -hmm. we've also been busy on a number of other fronts. Another focus has been monitoring and staying involved with the implementation of the Postal Service's 10-year strategic plan, the Delivering for America plan. When we last met in Chicago, the plan was underway, but it was very new. We still didn't know how much of it would shake out once actually implemented. But we have closely monitored this plan. We have been actively involved in all aspects of it. One notable portion of the plan that we have long advocated for is modernizing postal services vehicle fleet. The long line vehicles have reached the end of their vehicles. The long line vehicles have reached the end of their long lives. From the very start of this process, NALC was involved in the design of the next generation delivery vehicle. I personally began to work with them on the design and development of the NGDB all the way back in 2013. Dozens of letter carriers have also been involved in the design and subsequent testing of the vehicle and every step of the development process. We gathered feedback from members across the country. We raised those concerns about the current plan and how that translated into what needed to be included in any new vehicle. As a result, all new vehicles will include air conditioning, advanced safety technology, and they will meet the needs of our work, not just 
today, but into the future. We also secure billions of dollars in funding through our work with the White House and Congress to accelerate the deployment of this new fleet. These are much needed upgrades, as you all know better than anyone, and we have continued to work towards. In May, the first four NGDBs were deployed in Athens, Georgia. These vehicles, which happen to be gas powered, are being integrated into the fleet following letter carriers receiving proper familiarization and training. Now, a significant number of this initial deployment of vehicles in 2024 will be electric. And after 2026, all new vehicles added to the fleet will be electric vehicles. That's two years. Our goal has always been to ensure that the Postal Service acquires a delivery vehicle fleet that provides a safe and ergonomic working environment for letter carriers. And we are finally well on our way to achieving that. The operational changes included in the original plan a few years ago have really undergone major, major changes. As a result of engagement from a variety of state stakeholders, It has a 
slow down. Four letter carriers tragically have been murdered on the job since we last met in Chicago. Yeah. Brother Andre Cross, Branch 2 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Brother John J. Davis, Branch 385 in Youngstown, Ohio. Brother Jay Larson, Branch 245 in Rockford, Illinois. And just recently, Sister Octavia Redmond, Branch 11 in Chicago. We're all performing their duties when they were citizens. It's heartbreaking, it is appalling, and it is completely unacceptable. It is completely, and it is completely unacceptable. There are also, unfortunately, hundreds of other stories of letter carriers being robbed or attacked often at gunpoint. This has understandably led many of our members fearful to simply do their jobs. As we started really looking into these statistics of these crimes, we were extremely alarmed to find that very few of them were properly prosecuted at the federal level. So criminals were attacking our members, federal employees in uniform, serving their communities with no consequences. This inaction sparked something in our union. And in the last year, more than 15 branches around the country have held events to rally and declare enough is enough. I've traveled coast to coast to join our members at these rallies to raise awareness about this crime that's happening against letter carriers. We made our collective voice heard and asked the public to keep an eye out for us the way we've always looked out. And no surprise to any of us in this room, our members deliver results. Recently, we've seen prosecution rates increase and more criminals are being held accountable. But more needs to be done if we will not stop until every single crime against a letter carrier has been prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. We also took this issue to Capitol Hill. Issue to Capitol Hill. To Capitol Hill. In March, Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, a Republican from Pennsylvania, and Congressman Greg Landsman, a Democrat from Ohio, introduced the Protect Our Letter Carriers Act. And we're fortunate that we will get to hear from both of these members of Congress later this week. This bipartisan legislation is the critical next step to deter these crimes from happening, prosecute anyone who attacks our members, and hold those who are found guilty accountable. This bill provides funding to replace their appeals, which we know most of the time these criminals are after with more secure electronic versions. When that key is devalued, letter carriers will be safer and less likely to be targeted on their routes. But this alone will not fix the problem. This bill also will ensure that there will be an assistant district attorney in every U.S. attorney's office designated to prioritize prosecuting these cases. No more pushing into the side and letting them sit on someone's knees. When a crime against a letter carrier happens, it must be prosecuted, and it must be prosecuted as soon as possible. Lastly, this legislation 
would send the message that any attack on the letter carrier is intolerable <laughs> by amending sentencing guidelines to treat these crimes the same as an assault on a federal law enforcement officer. Strengthen the 
Postal Service's finances. The April 2222 victory of postal reform being signed into law, a hard fought 12 year battle achieved by all of you, was a major step forward for the Postal Service. Repealing that crushing pre funding mandate was huge. Slash the Postal Service's losses by more than $4 billion annually. But we knew all along that that was only one piece of the equation. We still need a couple of other changes to happen before the Postal Service can truly be on financially solid ground. First, we need the Postal Service to be able to properly invest in its retirement funds. Currently, 100% of the agency's $300 billion in assets for pensions and retiree health is held in U.S. Treasury bonds. Well, I'm not sure how much everyone knows about Treasury bonds, but I can tell you they are known for higher rates of return. By leaving our money in these low-yielding bonds, the Postal Service money in these low-yielding money in these low-yielding bonds, the Postal Service is losing out on billions of dollars each year in potential investment. So we are urging Congress to allow the agency to responsibly diversify its investment portfolio. And later today, we will hear from Congressman Stephen Lynch, from right here, who will be introducing legislation to do just that when Congress returns from their office recess. A common sense change like this could make a real difference to the Postal Service's bottom line and its balance sheet. Secondly, for more than 50 years, the Postal Service's contributions to the Civil Service Retirement Fund have been miscalculated. This miscalculation has resulted in over $90 billion in unjust expenses for the agency. This is unfair. We have been working to get it fixed. While our recent efforts have focused on working through presidential administrations to make this change, we are open to all avenues and possibilities, and we will pursue it through legislation if that is what it will take to finally correct this long-standing problem. To protect letter carrier jobs, benefits, and retirement, we must make sure the Postal Service is financially when we sit down at the bargaining table, it looks a lot different. Things might even happen a little faster if our counterparts on the other side are not operating deep in the rain. So it is critical that we prioritize advocating for these important policies, advocating, advocating for these important policy changes. We're convening here in Boston just a few months before 2024 election, which I think is safe to say will be an election that none of us will ever forget. The presidency, control of both the House and the Senate is up for grabs. There's no doubt that there is a lot at stake this year on election day. Brothers and sisters, democracy is on the ballot. And now, maybe more than any time in our history, it is important for all of us to familiarize ourselves with the candidates, to know where they stand on NALC's priority issues, and have a plan to vote this November. Tomorrow's general session, we'll take a deeper look at how our work, how safe, secure, and accessible elections will be vote by mail. We'll also preview how democracy is at stake this election season and just how close our country claim came to losing our democratic system three years ago. Now, NALC has yet to make a presidential endorsement for the upcoming election. But this body this week will consider a resolution to endorse Vice President Kamala Harris for President of the United States.
help get out the vote and elect candidates in support of us. We'll work alongside our sister unions to elect candidates that support us across the federal government. We'll use our collective voice, our empowered solidarity, support, get out the vote efforts, and engage the members of our community. No one can predict the future. No one knows what the outcome these elections will be. But I know one thing for sure. We, the letter carriers, are ready to defend our democracy and deliver a democracy, democracy, and deliver America's votes once again. So please participate in our democratic process, not just through our work as letter carriers, but by having a plan to vote yourself. I spoke earlier about this year's convention today. Grow, rise together. But as I mentioned, this is more than just a theme here in Boston. This lays a foundation for our union's work over the next two years and beyond after we wrap up the current round of collective bargaining. Grow, rise together is an extensive plan that introduces new initiatives and expands on existing ones that will strengthen our union at every level. I won't get into every single piece here today because it touches every single aspect of AMC in some way, but I do want to take some time to highlight a few critical elements that will help us grow and rise together. First is our ongoing and future investment in education. The key to improving representation is educating and sharpening the skills of everyone who has taken on the responsibility of representing our members by making that training as widely available as we possibly can. We are investing in standardizing much of our training and delivering it in a modular format. This format will allow it to be used in a variety of settings, from the training that NALC headquarters provides, regional training that are conducted by our excellent MBAs and regional office staff, as well as the branches out there that provide training, as well as the branches out, as well as the branches out there that provide training to stewards and other representatives. For example, this modular format would allow those branches out there that have steward meetings to pull out short segments to teach in each of your meetings. The first piece we tackled was shop steward training. Headquarters staff, with the, help, with the help of several others from around the country, developed curriculum and tested it with a class of stewards in early July. We are excited to deploy this piece of the training soon, as well as develop curriculum on a number of other topics in the same module. Besides quality curriculum, the way we teach, the way we teach, the way we teach is a key to effective education. We owe it to those that come to any training to teach them in a way that gives them the best opportunity to learn. We will train our trainers to use teaching techniques based on how adults learn. These train the trainer sessions in the very near future become a crucial part of our education program. We are also in the midst of developing an e-learning virtual training platform. We must use available technology to make training available to as many of our members in as many ways as we can. While this platform certainly will not replace in-person training, nor is it intended to do that, it will be a new resource and expand opportunities for those who want to get involved but maybe can't make an in-person training or they prefer to do training on their own. This project requires significant resources and time to develop, but it is regressive. It will both increase access, more learning, as well as develop well-rounded leaders for our future. Another issue 
we continue to fight in numerous locations. As the Postal Service's continued failure to comply with the terms of our collective bargaining agreement and grievance settlements and decisions. Our primary means to address their non compliance is and always will be our grievance arbitration procedure. NALC has the most sophisticated and successful grievance arbitration procedure in the history of the American labor world. We are good at enforcing our agreement, and we are only going to get better. While we continue to file and win grievances when our rights are violated, there's a deep-rooted problem, and it's got an out of hand. Some managers have taken the approach that complying with the terms of our agreement is optional. And that they can simply pay a grievance settlement if they choose not to comply. Wrong. Compliance is not optional. But the Postal Service has demonstrated that it won't or can't make its managers comply with their obligations that have been negotiated in good faith. Like a lot of you in this room, I've had enough of it. Brothers and sisters, this is a fight. And we as a union will use every available tool we have to win this fight. From the Department of Labor to our friends in Congress, it's time to turn up the pressure. So to all of you in this hall, and outside this hall to represent our members, keep fighting. Keep doing the hard work, and together we will attack this problem. And we will do what our union has done for 135 years, win for our members.
hailed our first ERT trade for 30 activists from around the country. They came out of that trade with the knowledge, tools, and techniques necessary to provide crisis support for our members and were immediately deployed to the field. They are helping members with situations like the loss of a co-worker, a significant accident, or other traumatic incidents. In the future, we plan to train more ERT representatives and expand the program's coverage to include other topics. In September, we will bring our ERT together to provide training on suicide awareness and prevention as our next step. While these are difficult situations to walk into, I am so proud of our ERT representatives and the invaluable work that they are doing. Our ERT program is already proving what I already knew, and so did all of you. That if given the opportunity and the knowledge to help fellow union members, our members will jump at that chance and go above and beyond. That's exactly what they do. I know our ERT members are eager to help. So if you or someone you know could use their assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out. There was a workshop conducted this morning on the new ERT program, so I hope you were able to check that out and get some information about the assistance and support that they provide. NALC proudly represents one of the most diverse union memberships in the country. Our diversity is one of our greatest strengths. And for our union to be as successful as we can be, we must continue to embrace our diversity. To embrace, we must continue to embrace our diversity. So we've set up new initiatives to help us better support our members and strengthen our union. First is a formation of a group to look at ways to better embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion in our union. We'll focus on understanding and utilizing the diversity of our membership. To be as strong as we can be, we must increase access and make it as easy as possible for anyone, regardless of their race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or anything else to get involved in NALC. There's an introduction to diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop scheduled this afternoon. So if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to check that out. We're also creating a women's mentoring program that will identify, support, and develop current and future women leaders in our community. It is undeniable that women who take on or wish to take on a new responsibility or leadership role face challenges simply because they are women. This is an unfortunate reality in our world. As a union, we should be doing everything possible to make it easy and accessible for women who want to step up. This program will have experienced mentors who can help other women navigate these challenges in their roles. And I hope and expect it will result in more women serving in leadership roles at the branch level and beyond, which will make our union strong. On Wednesday morning, during the workshops, there will be a roundtable discussion on these issues featuring an outstanding group of women that currently serve as leaders. So if you're interested, I hope you're able to join me on that. Now, I've laid out a lot. Now, I've laid out a lot for you here this morning. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. We talked about what we've been working on towards what we're going to implement to get there.
common thread to accomplish any meaningful results is to do it together. Our solidarity is what makes our union strong. It's what grounds us in our rich history and it's what will propel us in the future. Next year, will mark the 250th anniversary of the United States Postal Service. Despite our frustration with management, never-ending battle, prove our jobs, I think we can all agree, working for the Postal Service is still something to be proud of.